morning. Hey, what's up, my humans? This is Trisha with The Truth, and you are the truth. So today, we're going to have a special guest. We're going to be talking about throat singing. I've been experimenting with this a bit lately, and I have some videos, um, and I'll show that a little bit later on. But first, uh, I want to hear from Zachary, um, the types of throat singing there are, and um, just some tips and tricks, perhaps, because... You know, I've been really trying it and just seeing where I can go and how to sustain the sound. Um, so yeah, anyways, we'll get into that. I've been working on it. I'm happy with where I'm at as far as like the journey. Anyways, let's hear more about it from Zachary. All right, yeah, no, with throat singing, um, as you can tell, I'm Asian. Um, I was adopted uh, 98 by my mother. Later, she went back a few years later to adopt my two brothers met my dad, married him, he adopted all three of us at once, and we grew up in Whitewater. Um, my parents are, of course, both white, um, but they took the time and they tried to make sure that my brothers and I were raised with an appreciation and awareness of our uh, home culture, our sort of birth culture. Um, so ethnically, we're Boryats, um, and the Boryats are the largest indigenous people of Siberia. Um, which is that whole region taken up by Russia um, and kind of seeps a little bit into Mongolia and northern China a bit. And so sort of that is raising up this appreciation of Boryat culture, of Mongol culture, of figures like Genghis Khan um, and Mandahai Khan. One of the big cultural facets, you know, of any culture is music. And I was always interested in music. I play a few different instruments like piano, and uh, button accordion. And so one of the things that I really latched on to, especially in high school when I did choir, is a style of singing called throat singing. And many different cultures have their own varieties. I think the Khusa have some, the Inuits have their own. But in Mongolia and Tuva, it's often referred to in the West as Tuvan throat singing. Mm. Tuva, like the Boryats, um, are another indigenous people of Siberia that have a very strong connection to the Mongols um, and often self-identifies being a Mongolic people as well. Um, and so what it is, it's multi-tonal singing where you can sing, we're producing um, from one individual anywhere between two to nine distinct sounds at once. Mm -hmm. um, and within that, there are a few different styles. Um, the most common you're probably going to hear is called hume. Um, and hume is that, uh, well, if you already know what throat singing is, that's sort of the one that's most famous. There was this band that went viral a couple months ago called The Who. Oh, yeah. And yep, I've heard they of were, yep, yeah, they did a lot of that heavy metal rock stuff. Right. Um, and a lot of throat singing they did in their music is hume. And so hume goes a little bit like, uh, <clears throat> Awesome. Like I, I want to ask you all the questions about that now. Like how, how do you just start it? Because I feel like um, I have to start with the tone and then get down to that like... No, you don't like. actually start with the tone at all. Um, hmm. And this is sort of... Uh, uh, I used to speak, when I was two years old, I used to speak Russian, but living in, growing up in the Upper Peninsula and then in Wisconsin, there aren't too many Russian speakers here, so I ended up dropping that. Um, in lieu of English. Um, so that's really where having the internet really came in handy because I was able to just Google how to do throat singing and that became what I did like every evening after school, my oh, freshman wow. year, my sophomore year of high school being like, how do you do this? And what is it, what it is, is it's like, uh, like, most, like most singing, it's very mechanical. And so to actually get that, um, that tone, it's utilizing not only your vocal cords, it's utilizing your epiglottal flap. The epiglottal flap is what keeps uh, food, for example, when you're swallowing, it keeps it from getting into your lungs. Um, you all know that feeling when you swallow badly, when you're drinking a cup of water, yeah. you just start choking. That's because some water got seeped into your, into your uh, esophagus there and into your lungs. Um, mm. And so with throat singing, or at least with Hume, 
what you're doing is you're forcing um you're forcing not only your vocal cords to vibrate but you're also on command forcing your epiglottal flap to vibrate as well mm -hmm. um and the english alphabet only has so many each alphabet each language really has only so many sounds right. the english and most western languages don't have any sounds that are really fricative that utilize that flap right um arabic for example has a letter called ha yeah. which does utilize that flap a little bit more um and so what i came across when trying to to practice who um is a is a uh, is a technique and it's basically well since you're basically just trying to practice a set of muscles that you basically never use right. is well how to engage those muscles and the way that we most commonly use your stuff your um epiglottal flap is by clearing your throat mm. and so it started out with just for like a good five ten minutes just like a, just trying to clear your throat kind of like <clears throat> right <clears throat> like i do that, that a lot so because <laughs> that forces that flap to move mm. um eventually you can open up your mouth as you do that so it kind of goes from a closed mouth <clears throat> into more like a um <clears throat> so when you first start practicing it really has to deal with um basically if you can clear your throat for a good 10 minutes straight <laughs> you're on your way but i know for me it took it took well over a year to even get to a point where it even sounded like I was trying to do it on purpose right. before it even sounded right. like anything approachable to music. I always clear my throat, but like, yeah, let me let me try to like with with my mouth open. I don't know if I <clears throat> like that. Yeah, um, with clearing your throat, you're of course kind of making that sort of initial push because again, with clearing your throat, it's to sort of clear anything you know in your throat. Right. With uh, throat singing, you want to try and prolong that. For as long as possible so can i <clears throat> instead of just explosive like that you can go <clears throat> i'm, I'm gonna like practice that, that now yeah. okay <laughs> it, it takes a tremendous amount of practice it helps to be laying down let me try that <laughs> excuse me while i'm playing with my voice here and this is just a melody that i just created in my mind you know for me to like i don't know i was just playing with my range too so <sighs> here we go that was interesting Ooh. all right well it's the next day and i'm trying again and hope you're enjoying all these random snapchat filters <laughs> so yeah follow me on snapchat <laughs> i think it's trisha with the truth or trisha with truth on all social media so Ooh. apparently now i'm trying to start my motorcycle <laughs> well it is the next day and i'm really sleepy so my voice is like already like like that so strategy i don't know Ooh. that's weird it's vibrating back there without me trying. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Yeah, it really takes quite a bit of dedication um, in a way that, you know, natural singing really doesn't right. um, because natural singing just utilizes your vocal cords your voice box which we use every day when you talk right. so but that's the style that i've been i think that's the style that i've been trying but <laughs> <laughs> so let me see if i can do it because of course since i just found found it well i mean of course i had heard of throat singing before um but then i just for whatever reason just kind of got caught down that rabbit hole of youtube and i was just fascinated mm -hmm. like how how do they actually do it and found a couple people who explained a bit and then of course just experimenting back here and like oh like you know finding out what's what's mm -hmm. all back there and what i can do and 
it's funny because like so I grew up in a family that was very loud you know so and we all sing and so around the house we would just be like hey and then I like to annoy my brother so I would make sounds like ah, you know so I found mm -hmm. sometimes my throat um, would naturally go to that when I'm trying to do throat singing but I was like that doesn't feel right so then I found okay so if I make a tone and it, I try to go lower of course but so but I, I like to start high so like ah, and then it's like I don't know the one um the one video maybe said that you can try to start with the tone and then try to make that the uh, sound with it. Um, well, that yeah. actually, I saw that too. And my mm. opinion on that is that's sort of actually a trap, a bit of a pitfall. Ah. Um, because to me, that's very much that, uh, oh, there's a term for it, and I can't remember what it is, but it's like that stereotypical a vocal, West Coast vocal California fry. girl where she kind of like, where you know, you kind of talk like it, uh, like that, uh, kind of like that low drone. Yeah. The thing is that it's not a tone thing because you can do it at any, I mean, it's going to be whatever sort of your natural note is going to be. So for me, I usually speak at around like a B flat area. Mm -hmm. And because of that, my throat singing, uh, usually comes out to a B flat and a, or something like that. Okay. Um, so saying that, you know, starting high, starting low, and working into that, that really isn't useful until you've already mastered the whole, uh, um, the yeah, actual I, muscle I feel, mechanics. I feel like I need to be lower in my register, though, to try to get there, because I, I think I naturally have a higher-pitched voice, mm -hmm. but, so can you do throat singing in, like, a higher-pitched voice, too? Well, you can, um, and that's actually one of the two other styles. There are two sub-styles. One of the, uh, so the most common form of singing is Hume. The second most common is probably Kargara. Okay. And Kargara is two styles. There's Mountain Kargara and Plains Kargara. No, not Plains, um, Steps. Um, like the Steps of Mongolia. Because Mongolia is very, has the Steps of Mongolia, those grasslands, those Plains features. And then it also has quite a bit of mountains. Um, I forget which one is which right now, but um, with Kargara, that's kind of like allowing you to talk. So, so you can tell that's a much higher register than my right. May voice, which is again, and then there's the, uh, I believe Mountain Kargara is the real low one. And that, I can't do that one quite yet. Um, that's more along the lines of like if you listen to Russian opera, when you have operas, you have like the uh, baritone and tenor, or like in Italian operas, the most prestigious um, um, position for a player to be, especially if they're male. Um, in Russian opera, they have the, uh, 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 oh, I think it's called a contrabass singer. And it's that idea where it's a much older uh, male opera performer being able to sing sort of lower than low right. and that's sort of mountain uh, uh mountain cargara so i think with you and that one i imagine it's still using that very bass uh epiglottal flap but it's coming higher sort of in the back of the throat producing a higher pitch tone so again it really has less to do with tones than it does with again just getting started with that pure muscle group controlling your epiglottis another really good example practice that i did a lot is trying to imagine or actually doing it pushing against the wall and if you're trying to push against the wall hopefully if it's a sturdy wall you're not going to be able to move it but exerting that force exerting that pressure you're going to naturally make a grunt like a uh, like that mm. and that grunt is the other way especially in english where we use that same group that that muscle group like clearing your throat um, exerting pressure like grunting and it's going to come out at a natural at a whatever your sort of natural speaking tone is so again mm -hmm. tone is one of those things where where uh, if you're doing classical singing you're not going to practice vibrato immediately vibrato comes after you've been singing quote unquote normally and that vibrato develops on its own for that individual for mm -hmm. that singer and that's sort of how I view 
tonality and sort of pitches that comes along with once you actually master the thing on demand um the other thing i like to imagine um i'm not sure how smoking diseases work mm-hmm. but when you've met real heavy smokers they kind of talk in a really oh, gravelly yeah. voice and when you funny. talk like that that's more akin to cargara but the same thing that the same principle applies is you're using your epithetical flap mm-hmm. um it has less to do with me trying to make a solid a solid tone it has less to do with um trying to change the pitch with the volume of my mouth or the shape of my tongue or something right. because once you start to be able to make a consistent tone that's when you're able cuz most of the um you can change sort of the base note of what your throat singing is but 90% of the tonal changes isn't actually in the throat at all 90% of that is happening within in your mouth um right. so you control that by manipulating your tongue um by pulling the tongue further to the top of the mouth so that it creates a smaller cavity pushing your tongue to the back of their mouth which creates sort of a more restricted airway as the air leaves your throat and fills the chamber of your mouth um pursing your lips um opening and closing your mouth so you can tell that the drone was more or less the same pitch Mm-hmm. that again I think around B flat last time I checked but I was able to change the tone of it by changing my mouth shape and the position of my tongue within my mouth. Yeah, I was I think the first thing I experimented with was like um I think I was doing just kind of vibrating back here so it's like ooh mm-hmm. that like that was fun. I was like, "Oh, that's that is different. very good. That's um cuz you can have straight overtone singing um cuz who may it's overtone singing with that uh 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 throat drone in overtone singing it's just trying to get overtones in the mute in the uh, sounds you produce so that could be like oh and that anyone can do because you're just forcing a ton of air all at once and changing um cuz you have that bass note of the uh almost like a air bay air bay um bake pipes while the pitch and toner is being manipulated by again the shape of your mouth not by your vocal cords so uh, 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 right. and that's actually the best way well no it's the best way but that's how i usually practice tones um with throat singing because of course the drone again it's all the epiglottal flap is just kind of uh, simultaneously um activating along with your vocal cords. Would you not recommend then doing the whole I think they term it um vocal fry. So is that not that, what That's it's what I was to do? that's what it was. Vocal fry that is different than throat singing. Um I mean vocal fry it's a lot more similar to that Cargarai mentioned where it's like it's just talk it's just talking like this. Mm-hmm. Um and that's higher up in the throat. Um because, again, I don't know the mechanics of vocal fry, so I'm going to look like a total yeah, idiot. Yeah. Well, no, because it's like, it feels like it's, well, I feel like there's one way to do it where I would hurt my throat, but then the other way that I found to do it doesn't seem to hurt my throat, and that's where I try to mix it with the tone, and I'm, mm-hmm. I've am i been able to get, like, the, the lower frequency that sounds like a note, but it's like mixing those two things, but it sounds like that, that's not... Well, with not... vocal fry, you're definitely doing it higher in the throat with... Because again, that's not where your epiglottal flap is. Your epiglottal flap, flap, um, or epiglottis is further down in your throat because it's right where the uh, the tubes change from your throat into your stomach to the tubes going into your lungs. So if you're doing hume, you're definitely targeting lower in the throat. When I first practiced about a month or two in of like practicing every day without singing. Um, I pushed myself to the point where I literally lost my voice for a two week, a two day period. Oh my. Um, so there is a serious danger with throat singing right. when it comes to over practicing and over exerting yourself. And sort of that's why I really want to push caution because if you are just if you already do like to sing a lot, much less having to talk, um, right. if you lose your voice, especially now where everything is done over virtual stuff now. Um, you know that can have actually serious 
consequences in your ability to sing, right. just to communicate in general. For me, it didn't cause permanent damage, but it could cause permanent damage. Right. Um, so there's that thing, try not to do it like over 30 minutes a day. Oh, and yeah. just sort of physically, you're probably not going to be able to do it for more than maybe 10, 15 minutes a day, depending on how much you already used your epiglottal flap muscles to begin with. Right. Because even me doing having done it now for just a few minutes with you, my throat is definitely a lot more sore. Right. Yeah, I always told myself, just because I didn't know what I was doing, of course, and I get concerned about that. Um, I just, when, whenever it would hurt, I would just stop, drink water, take some honey, and then, you know, practice mm -hmm. the next day or take a couple days. But I wish someone could tell me when I activate that part. <laughs> you like know, I said, a... I was not, the first time I was able to produce something that even sounded akin to throat singing, instead of just trying to clear my throat for five minutes straight, that was about half a year in of practice. There are multiple roads to the same conclusion, to the same destination. Right. So necessarily what works for me may not necessarily work for you. Um, yeah, I guess it's like, it's more like, am I doing it correctly? Am I harming myself kind of thing? I mean, actually, the, the first thing I saw was someone, I believe, from Mongolia or from that area. So, of course, I was like, okay, he knows what he's talking about. He's good. He's professional, you know. Um, and he was saying something like, start with how a goat sounds or a sheep or something, you know, and make that sound in the back of your voice. And so I was trying that, and then I was just experimenting. And so I think I naturally found that balance, like I said, between that, like, annoying sound that I made to my brother and more of just the other whatever that is, the vocal fry, they call it. And then I, I found that the one white guy, who maybe I think you said you saw too, um, said to c combine the tone with the the vocal fry, which I which I was naturally which I naturally got to, and it wasn't harming me. So I was like, okay, mm -hmm. at least I'm not harming myself. But then it's like, am I doing this correctly? And then how do I sustain it? And and there yeah. are three different styles. So right, you may not necessarily be aiming for one, but the vocal fry is definitely more akin to kargara mm -hmm. rather than who may. Um, there's a third style of Mongolian throat singing, or this one is more closely akin to uh, overtone singing, and that's uh, it has uh, could also be called overtone whistling. The Mongolian guy trying to like sound like a goat. I mean that's pretty accurate because um, in Mongol sort of religious history, the animalism is a huge part of one of their major mm -hmm. faith traditions and spiritual practices, which is shamanism. And so it's the common um, belief, and most likely true, that throat singing comes from imitation of animal sounds. Sure. It's also an effective way to communicate over long stretches of uh, planes and steps, yeah. for like uh, much akin to yodeling in, is a good way to communicate over valleys in mm -hmm. northern Europe. Um, it's that same thing, like a human wouldn't naturally think to come up with that sort of noise unless it had a purpose. The third style is Sigit, and Sigit or Sugut is actually probably the easiest for someone to learn and pick up because it doesn't involve any of that throat stuff. Mm. What's actually happening is you're just creating, you're just, you're using your vocal cords normally to produce a single note, Ooh, a tone, um, that's sort of your bass tone. Um, the trick to it is that what's actually happening is that your tongue is sort of forming a cup inside the roof of your mouth or inside your mouth and mm -hmm. it's sealing itself just behind the teeth to the roof of to the roof of your mouth um trying to create as close a seal as possible you then purse your lips like a whistle as normal um and you want to try and create a hole between the roof of your mouth and your tongue so that air can escape Oh, travel wow. between the teeth and out your lips so so how do they professional singers do a whole song without it hurting it's just because they're used to using i am not a professional singer i don't know how professional singers do i don't know how professional singers sing using normal voices which I can also I can <laughs> sing with my normal voice just fine, right, right. but I don't know how professional singers do it differently than I do. It's not what I studied. Um, and a lot of it really just comes to being able to, just being used to it. 
<sighs> well, I feel like I have a lot to do now. <laughs> if you wanted to learn another style of uh, music, and specifically singing in Mongolia, uh, when you mentioned your brother and trying to create that grunting noise to annoy your brothers, um, I was wondering if you could do that again, because the way that you were sort of, your voice had that sort of normal sound, but then it sort of got to that part where you were really forcing a lot of air. In mm. Mongolia, there's a style of singing called the long song, mm. and I could send you a video of that, sure. where it's very akin to the noise you were doing. Mm. Yeah, I love, I love like being loud and like extending um, like one note just and holding that as long as possible. It just, it's so meditative and, mm -hmm. and healing. And, and really again good. in Mongolia, that's a whole style of singing. Let's see if this oh, video is. So cool. Oh yeah, this is a wonderful example. You know, you know what it reminds me of though. When when I was in China. Um, in Inner Mongolia, they, I think they called it like Chinese opera. And when we went there, of course, I'm thinking like la, 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 that kind of opera, but it was more like ah, like that kind of sound where, it, yeah, to the Western ear, yeah, we were. I don't know anything about something. Chinese opera. I know yeah. um, it's called the long song because. Well, first of all, the songs are meant to be long, upwards of 10, 15 minutes. Oh, wow. But also each syllable tends to be then prolonged. So in a song that's a five minute song, the singer may have only actually sang a total of five words. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, in that uh, video I sent you, she's really just singing one note, well, not one note, one syllable at a time but that mm -hmm. syllable can go on for 10 15 seconds before mm -hmm. she sings the next one before yeah, she takes I, another I breath. I love that. I love that. That's that's mm -hmm. my style because it's just oh, it's you can you can breathe and you and you feel everything and it's so soulful and meditative and you know the mm -hmm. the other thing um yeah like you said it reminds me of like a bit of yodeling too which um, my my grandpa would would yodel to me sometimes you know so I I think I I should practice that too. Um, mm -hmm. And yodeling is, is a similar, I think all those, a lot of those styles of singing where it's not, um, probably do rely on sort of that same parts of the body, namely the diaphragm to really push all that air out at once. Yeah, I love that. Because again, their origins and their purposes are all sort of very similar. So thank you so much, Zachary, for um, sharing your knowledge of throat singing and more about the culture, too. I definitely learned mm -hmm. more things. And so um, while we didn't learn a language in this video, we definitely learned more about culture. But if you want to teach me some of your language to any of my subscribers or new folks, um, please let me know in the comments below. I'd be happy to learn some of your language. So if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. I love you, my humans. Uh, bring people together. I keep it truthful. Uh, <laughs> what the hell? I can't get back to that sound. Mm. <laughs> I'm out of breath. Don't look at my rice milk and cashews. <laughs> Focus.